What does that even mean, Bowers Game Corner? Oh, hi there, YouTube. I'm back again today for another game review. And today, I'm very excited for checking out 13 Days The Cuban Missile Crisis from Jolly Roger Games. This is for two players, ages 10 plus. It'll take about 45 minutes to play. And in 13 days, you're going to be playing as either the USA or the USSR going through the Cuban Missile Crisis, trying to gain the favor of different countries and world opinion, and trying in the end to have the most prestige. It is an area control game, but is it good? Let's open it up, and I'll tell you all about it. All right, then, we're going to take a look at what you're going to get inside of 13 days. First and foremost, we got our handy-dandy rule booklet. 21 pages, double-sided, full color, full of pictures, illustrations, examples. Uh, it seems really daunting at first until you actually realize you're only going to need the first nine pages to learn the game. And the rest is actually just a really thorough round-by-round uh, -round gameplay, which can be very helpful. That being said, the first nine pages are good. They're not great. They could be a little bit better, but they have enough pictures and illustrations that it will hold your hand and teach you how to play the game. So uh, next, you're going to have a brief history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, they did something similar to this in Twilight Struggle. I liked it then. I like it now. It's going to tell you about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it'll also go over all the different cards in the game and uh, the history behind those cards, which is really kind of cool to read if you're a history buff like me. So in 13 days, you are going to be playing a head-to-head -head game where one player is going to be playing as the USA, one player is going to be playing as the USSR, and you're going to try to have the most prestige after three rounds. You can also potentially lose the game immediately at the end of a round if you're too high on the DEFCOM track over here, which we'll talk a little bit later. The majority of the game, though, is going to be an area control game in which you're going to be placing your cubes on various different spots on the map, trying to have control of world opinion, uh, the military, and the political. So... We'll go over the components, then we'll get a little bit into the gameplay. So first component-wise, each uh, each player is going to have the red and the blue, which will be placing the influence cubes on the board like so. I'll get into what these little flags are in a second. You're also going to have the personal letter, which will start with the USA, USA player. This is just a card that will be passed back and forth, and this will allow you to do just a little bit extra on your turn when you have it. Also, if there's a tie at the end of the game, this will break the tie. So... Next, you're going to have two kinds of cards. The first kind of card are going to be strategy cards, which I'll talk a little bit more in depth in a couple minutes, but these are what they're going to be looking like. There's three different types. I'll talk about those in a second. And then you're going to have agenda cards, and this is actually how you are going to pretty much start the round. So I will start the round, and I'll give you a mock round so you can get a feel for how the game works. You got a nice little round track right here. First thing you're going to do is you're going to increase all of the DEFCOM tracks. Yes, even on the first turn of the game, because you're a little bit closer to nuclear war. Next, you're going to draw three of the agenda cards right here. You're going to take a look at them, and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put one of your flags on each of these locations up here. So for this instance, we have one on Turkey, one on Italy, and one on Berlin. Now, these cards are going to give you victory points at the end of the round. They're going to give a player a victory points. So the dominating player in Berlin receives prestige equal to the difference in influence cubes plus one. Likewise for Italy and Turkey, but Turkey is just a zero. So now what you're going to do is you're going to decide which one of these cards you want to play as your agenda. This means you're going to try and focus on that so you can gain prestige this way. But the key here is that your opponent never knows exactly which one you're going to be playing for because you have three flags out and you're only going to be picking one. So you know what? We got a, we already got a little lead in Italy to start off with, and it gives us plus one. So we would probably play the USA agenda of Italy. We're going to discard the other two cards, and then the other player would be doing that at the same time. So they tuck them right there, and we move on to the next phase, which is where you're going to draw five of these strategy cards right here. So... Next, you're going to decide who has the initiative. That means who's going to play the first card. Whoever is lower on prestige is going to pick who plays the first card. And if there's a tie, USSR always gets to pick who goes first. Generally, you want to go second so you can kind of react to what your opponent is doing. So you're going to take a look at your cards. There's three kinds of cards. You're going to have USSR cards. You're going to have USA cards. And then you're going to have UN cards. And they're pretty evenly distributed. Now, there's two things that you'll be able to do with a card generally. First thing you can do is you can play a card and you can take this many cubes off the board or put them on the board on a particular spot. So for instance, if we really wanted to bulk up Italy, we could play this card and boom, we could put two cubes on Italy. But since we're placing so much influence there, what's going to happen is we do go up one spot on the DEFCON track on the green right there. So we would go bloop up one, which would not be good. 
Now, the other option you could do with this card is you could use the special ability on the bottom. You can't do both, but you can do the special ability on the bottom. So this one, play an opponent. They can't use events from cards they played themselves to deflate their death contract for this round. So this would be a great card to play if someone was getting really close to being in trouble on the death com chart, or if somebody already was in trouble on the death com chart. But for this instance, we used it for the two cubes right there. Next, our opponent would do the same thing and it would get back to us. Now, we're the USA player and we have a problem right now because as you can see, we only have one USA card and three USSR cards. And with USSR cards, we are limited to only doing this ability right here. We cannot do the special ability down here. What makes it even worse is we have to offer our opponent a chance to do this ability. So let's just say, I don't have a choice, I have to play this card. The first thing I do is I hand this card to my opponent. They get to do this special ability if they want, then they hand it back to me and I get to place one cube out on the board. Pretty raw deal. Uh, it works the same way with the USA player though, or the USSR player. They can't play the USA cards except for the cubes on the side. What's gonna happen is you're gonna go back and forth placing your cubes all around the different spots on the board until you have only one card left. Now you're going to play Play that one card in what's called the aftermath pile down here. At the end of the game, whoever has the most cubes down here of their particular flag is going to win two prestige points. So it's a little bit of a balancing act because you definitely don't want to put your opponent's cards down there, but at the same time, there's some cards that you really don't want to hand over to your opponent to do that action. Likewise, you kind of sometimes don't want to put your card down here because you really want to use that ability. It's a very interesting aspect to the game. So there should be two cards in the aftermath right there at the end of this round, and we will go to the next phase. So we've done our five strategy cards, now we save one card for the aftermath, and then we go to the world opinion bonus, which are these three right here. Here. Now in this example I didn't go through everything, but normally somebody would probably put a cube on one of these spots because these will give you awesome abilities that you'll be able to do at the end of every round if you have ownership of that different place. So for instance, you'd start on the left and you move to the right, plus one, minus one on the death com track if you have the area control right there. So that'd be great if we did. Let's just pretend we had one blue cube. We could bloop, move this down one, which would be great. Next, United Nations, you take the personal letter from someone. So I forgot to mention what the personal letter does. So let's go back to this example right here where let's say we, we played this for two cubes. We would take this personal letter, we'd give it to our opponent, but we'd play it and we would get to put down an extra cube. But that does mean we would have to go up two on the DEF COM level instead of one. So if you go up, just if you place just one cube like this, you don't move the DEF COM level. If you place two cubes, then you go up one space. If you place three cubes, then you go up two spaces, so on and so forth. Likewise, when you take away cubes from a spot, you also can take away, uh, move down your DEF COM track. So it's a nice little balancing act there. So next thing you're gonna do, uh, World Opinion Bonus is an extra aftermath card. So if you have control of the alliances, you're going to draw one of the strategy cards, look at it, and decide if you want to play it right here or if you want to discard it. Obviously, we're the USA player, we would not want to play this. However, if you were the USSR player and you drew this card, you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm playing that right there. Also, if it's a UN card, you could potentially play it there to bluff your opponent to make them think that they should just give up on this, that it might be a lost cause. There's quite a few nuances here. So we've done our world opinion bonus, next we resolve our agendas. That's where we reveal what's going to happen. So for instance, this one has Italy. The dominating player receives prestige equal to difference in influence cubes. So we would have three in Italy, they have zero, so we'd get a move up a good deal. Likewise, the Atlantic, a dominating player receives prestige equal to difference in influence cubes plus X. Now the Atlantic and Cuba is a little bit different. How this works is, if, uh, for instance, if you're winning here by say two, and then you're winning this spot on Cuba, if you have majority here, you would get to go up plus one since all three of these are connected. It's an interesting little kink in the game. You get rid of all the agendas, you check to see if anyone either is up here with one of their cubes or has all three of theirs on the DEF COM, uh, on the DEF COM icon right there to see if there's nuclear war. If no one does, then you advance the round marker and you rinse, wash, and repeat. You go for three rounds, Whoever has the most prestige at the end of the game is the winner of the game. And that, in a nutshell, is how 13 Days is played. 
Alrighty then, 13 days the Cuban Missile Crisis from Jolly Roger Games. What are my final thoughts? Let's go over the pros, let's go over the cons. First on the con side, it's two players built from the ground up, very restricted player count. If you're not on the mark for two player games, this one's not going to be for you. Also, if you're looking for a meteor experience, if you're going into this thinking, man, I really enjoyed Twilight Struggle, I think I'm going to like this game an awful lot, this one might not be meaty enough for you. While there are some interesting choices and some interesting mechanisms in this game, and I'm going to recommend this game, if you're going into this thinking this is a big meaty game, it might disappoint. Another con is if you're not a big fan of the Cuban Missile Crisis, this might fall a little bit flat because it's very rich thematically, which for most people is going to be a pro, but for some people will be a con. Now, onto the components. I do have one small complaint with the components, aside from the rule booklet, I wish it was just a little bit better, but it's not a bad rule booklet, is the cards. The card quality is very flimsy. I was incredibly disappointed with the cards in this game. They feel really light. Um... They just needed to be a little bit thicker, which is a surprise because I feel like component-wise, elsewhere, everything else is very nice. The cubes, the board, the box, everything looks good, but the cards are just a little bit too thin for my liking. Not a huge deal breaker. You're not going to be shuffling them too often, but it is something I did want to mention. Moving on to the pros, I really enjoyed 13 Days the Cuban Missile Crisis. I had a lot of fun with this game. Um... What I like about the game, first, it's very rich thematically. The history comes out very well. They got pictures from the time. They got backstories about all the cards in the little booklet, which I do enjoy when they did that. The rule booklet has tons and tons and tons of pictures. And even though it could be better, in my opinion, it could be a little bit better well done, it really holds your hands with all, I mean, there's a playthrough that's 12 pages and tons of illustrations, so that's always a good thing. Also, I liked how simple and easy to learn and easy to teach this game was. Once you know what you're doing, it's really an incredibly simplistic game, but with a little bit of bite. It meshes together a lot of really cool things. I like the fact that your opponent never really knows where you're focusing. And from time to time as you go through the game, you'll realize that maybe you focused a little bit too heavily one round. So the next round, you're kind of trying to play catch up because you got to pick up cubes and place them in different spots. And you're trying, you know, it's really interesting that aspect where you never exactly know where you're going to need to focus on the next round. So you don't want to just weigh yourself down too heavily in certain spots, especially once you get to round three, because if you do that, you're going to get to round three, you're going to be high on the DEFCOM track, you're going to be like, oh man, I need to focus on Cuba and I don't have any cubes on Cuba. And well, I thought it was an interesting little aspect there. Um... Overall, it's just a solid two-player game. Honestly, if you enjoy two-player games, if you routinely two play two-player games and you like history, this is definitely one I can recommend. So the question is, if you're not a history buff, can I recommend this game? Does it stand on its own merits as a two-player game? And I say yes. It's still a very fun, interesting area control game uh, because it is difficult to do area control, especially with two players, and I feel like this game succeeds at it. So, Overall, 13 Days of Cuban Missile Crisis is a game that I really did enjoy. I wish the, card was, the cards were a little bit thicker. I wish the rule booklet was a little bit clearer, but still a very enjoyable game. One I can definitely recommend if you're in the market for a two-player game. That is 13 Days of Cuban Missile Crisis 1962. If you enjoyed this review, please be sure to click on the subscribe button down below in the comments below. Let me know if you're going to watch any show on the History Channel and just veg out to it. What is the time period you want to learn about the most? For me personally, I'm probably going World War II. I'm a big World War II buff. I always lo love learning about that. My dad, or my, not my dad, my grandpa fought in World War II. I've always found it very fascinating. But what is the time period that you would like to focus on if you had to veg out to a history theme show? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for your time, YouTube.